Good afternoon. Uh, we live in an era where problems seem to be insatiable and unsolvable. And uh, I think I know why. Let's take, for example, incarceration. Right here in our home province of Manitoba, the Auditor General put out a report a few years ago warning governments that if they weren't to back off the significant increases in incarceration, it would cost $1.5 billion of your taxpayer money. And by the way, most of the people that are locked up are indigenous in this province. And uh, it's not hard to see how those numbers come by when it's $220,000 per jail cell and $100,000 a year um, to, to put somebody into that cell. Also, the same problems we have with health care. 75% of our health care expenditures are now on diseases where diet is a main risk factor, yet governments seem to be doing nothing to, change, to help us change our diets. The Bank of Canada has warned governments that if things continue on the path that they are, that 80% of our provincial spending will be on health care within the next decade, leaving only 20% for all the other things that are very important. And um, child, child welfare. Manitoba has more indigenous children in care than there ever were in residential schools. It's cost $1.8 million per child to have them raised in the system from baby to age 18. Now, could it be that governments are obsessed with problems and maybe they're even addicted? And could it be that the problems aren't the problem? Maybe the issue is that we need to be focusing on problem solvers. My theory in Army of Problem Solvers is that, indeed, you need a problem solver to solve a problem. This is not something that governments have got their heads around yet, but we believe we're pushing in this direction. Now, who are the problem solvers? Well, in, in my book, I break them out into three different groups. There's the social entrepreneurs, and we all know uh, Elon Musk. He, it is a for-profit venture, Tesla, and his goal is to electrify the transportation sector. Social entrepreneurs are a good example of problem solvers. Um, the, small farm and local f the small farms and local food movement is growing very quickly. These are folks that are selling directly to, to us as consumers without the salt and sugar that is causing our health care spending issues. They also use very little phosphorus and fossil fuels in their whole production process, which makes our lakes cleaner and uh, repopulates uh, our rural areas. And we have social enterprises as well, which are like the other two, but they're nonprofit, and we as nonprofits are using the market in order to achieve our mandates. Now, here's a continuum of all the different ventures that are there, ranging from a charity, like a food bank, for example, all the way to strictly profit-seeking companies. And social enterprises, we're non-profit, so we take the community-orientedness and we combine it with the market tools that are available from the private sector in order for us to reach scale. Let me give you an example. This is a staff photo from right here in Winnipeg, Winnipeg's north end of BUILD. BUILD is uh, now 11 years old and is accomplishing what is Canada's defining issue, and that is connecting people who most need the work with the work that most needs to be done. Now, uh, BUILD has hired over 600 people in its 11 years, and we've lowered utility bills at 16,000 low-income households for savings to government of about eight to nine million dollars a year just in utility bill costs. That's pretty exciting. We have other social enterprises here in Winnipeg like Manitoba Green Retrofit. Similar kind of staff photo with uh, people who are um, previously involved in gangs, for example, and were hired because they didn't have work experience, because they had a criminal record, because they didn't have grade 12 or a driver's license. One of the things that Manitoba Green Retrofit does is bed bug remediation. Imagine this new paradigm. We love bed bugs at social enterprises. Why? 
because we can hire people to remediate the bed bugs. And this is what's exciting as we move from the problem making paradigm into a problem solving paradigm. Now, what does the future look like? Well, I just am researching a new book and I just got back from, from Scotland. They have 5,600 social enterprises there, here in the homeland, in the homeland of uh, bagpipes and haggis. They're leading the world in social enterprise development and, and establishing one new social enterprise every day. So many social enterprises there that it amounts to about one for every thousand people in their population. Now, what are these social enterprises doing? What are they accomplishing? Well, 50% of them hire people with barriers to employment. Now, doesn't it make sense to you that if we're tired of paying for jails, we're tired of the inhumanity of locking people up who really need a job, doesn't it make more sense to engage social enterprises? Yes, we're tired of that. Now, two-thirds of these social enterprises in Scotland are run by women. You know, how many, how many of Canada's top 100 companies are run by women? Two. Doesn't it make more sense if we're interested in gender equality and to be making more compassionate decisions that we have more social enterprises? Of course it does. And interestingly, the average wage differential in social enterprises in Scotland is 2.5 to 1. That means that their CEOs make only two and a half times the average worker. In Canada's top 100 companies, the average CEO makes as much as the average employee by lunchtime on the first day. If we're interested in addressing income inequality in this country, it makes sense to be engaging social enterprises. This is a uh, co-worker of mine from the Peguis First Nation, and he and I both work at Aki Energy. Aki is an Ojibwe word for earth, so we're doing geo installing geothermal. And uh, Trevor, along with many of his co-workers, have installed now $8 million worth of geothermal on First Nations here in Manitoba with no government funding. How do we do that? Um, now, here's, here's when the paradigm gets interesting. Remember I talked about using money that's being spent on poverty in a different way. Well, Manitoba Hydro, our local utility here, provides the $20,000 up front. The First Nation installs the geothermal, and the bills go from this to this. And there's enough room in that those bill reductions that Manitoba Hydro puts a financing fee there, which they continue to collect until they get all their money back. And in this way, we're able to say at Weiwei Sikapo, Ojibwe Nation, we announced the new project, $8 million, 400 houses. And half of that $8 million would be on reserve labor. And how exciting this project was, and we didn't need any help from government at all, other than in this particular case, to, to get out of the way. And... Uh, <laughs> We got an email from the federal government saying, no, 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 we're not allowing you to do this anymore. If you want to do geothermal in First Nations, you have to apply for funding. And, of course, that's more expensive, and we're not able to get to scale, but the other thing about that is very important for us as Canadians to understand is that there's a tending process happens, and a company comes in from the outside and we continue to do things for and to Indigenous people in this country, and as a privileged person, I'm here to say this is going to stop, and it's going to stop now. So, now, so we're optimistic that the federal government will come to its senses. We've been having some good discussions with them, and when this, when this balloon breaks, uh, there'll be lots of ways that we can uh, achieve good outcomes, and we're very optimistic, but the battle is ongoing now. But just so you know, this isn't a one-off. Uh, we went to Garden Hill First Nation, where my co-worker, the CEO of uh, Aki Energy is from, his name's Darcy Wood, and uh, we went thinking, well, go to Garden Hill. It's a, it's a fly-in community, so you can't, you can't drive there. It's an Ojikri nation, about 700 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg. And he said, we, can we do something at home? I said, well, of course, we'll go and see. 
see what works. But when we got to Garden Hill, uh, I quickly saw, we quickly saw that they don't need lower utility bills. This is a First Nation whose priority is food. There were virtually no gardens in Garden Hill. Obviously, there used to be. It used to be a big thing for them. Um, as, as all Indigenous communities looked after their own food at one time. But Garden Hill especially was very proud. And there we saw a dialysis unit, which is for severe diabetics. And it's a million dollars of your taxpayer money for one dialysis bed and $100,000 a year to put somebody into that bed. And there are 38 people in Garden Hill who are on a wait list for dialysis. Almost half the people in Garden Hill, there's 4,400 people there, just one First Nation, either have diabetes or will soon have it. It is in an epidemic. Well, we know, and you now know, that you need a problem solver to solve a problem. So we set up a social enterprise called Aki Foods. Aki Foods uh, starts with a 13-acre farm. Now, 13 acres for you non-farmers is a big the size of a large shopping center, including their, their parking. We have an orchard, chickens and turkeys and lots of vegetables. And we have kids coming from the school engaging in the process. And it's all very exciting, except for this one little problem. Um, and I want you to remember that where there's bad government policy means that there's going to be bad outcomes. And in Garden Hill, the federal government, through the Nutrition North Canada Subsidy Program, gives a million dollars a year of your taxpayer money to a monopoly retailer that sells mostly unhealthy food. Now, guess how much Aki Foods gets? Guess how much Garden Hill gets for its farm and healthy food operation, which is creating employment and changing the food system to be much more, much, in a much healthier fashion. Zero. Nothing. Why? Because in order to be eligible for the food subsidy, the food has to come in from outside. This is going to change, and it is going to change now. Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, finish with a story. and. Uh, it was about eight years ago, our conservative federal government, you might remember, was working really hard to lock up more people. There was mandatory minimums, they were making it more difficult for people to get pardons, and these are my coworkers that they're messing with at this point. And uh, we were really upset with this, and we were particularly upset that our provincial NDP government uh, decided to go along with them and said, yes, we're tough on crime, we want to get on that boat as well. So we had a demonstration in front of the legislature and um, we're all mulling around in front of the legislature and I could hear somebody calling my name and it seemed to be kind of coming from on high. It's like, Sean. And I thought, wow, is that the justice minister leaning out his window saying, oh, we, we get it, you know, and on behalf of taxpayers, we are gonna go down the road of employment. We know social enterprises work. Um, we're going to uh, begin folk buying more goods and services from social enterprises. We know that this is the way forward, but it wasn't anyone leaning out that window. And I heard that my name again called with more urgency. Sean! And I looked and said, wow, could that be the premier? Hanging out his, <laughs> his window saying, yeah, you know, in this age of reconciliation, that we think that what you're saying is important and we're going to back off this very expensive, very unhealthy way to be Manitobans. But no one there either. Sean, with a lot of urgency. I look up on the roof of the legislature is Bruce Carson. Who is Bruce Carson? Well, Bruce Carson is a young Cree guy that used to work at Build with me. And uh, he was actually in between crack deals when he dropped off his resume with us, which qualified him for, uh, for a job. <laughs> and uh, so Bruce did really, really well. He took the parenting classes and the on-the-job training, and he was just a, a star, as are most people that we work with. 
And uh, in fact, the last time I saw Bruce, he got a job with a major construction company here locally, but he came to tell me something. He says, Sean, I just rented a three-bedroom house. Now, why, why am I telling you that he rented a three-bedroom house? Sean, I'm getting my kids back. Isn't this the type of thing we want to hear more of in this country? Yeah. So, back, back to the question at hand, what is Bruce Carson doing on the roof of the legislature? <laughs> so he's got a hard hat on, he's working for a trades company that's got a contract fixing the roof of the legislature. And uh, I can see he's got his tool belt on, and I can imagine he's got a wallet, and inside his wallet would be a picture of his kids, an apprenticeship card, there would be um, a driver's license, all the things that you and I take for granted. And I call my coworkers heroes because they're overcoming daily barriers to achieve the things that the rest of us find easy. And Carson, Bruce Carson, looked down at me and hollered something to me, but I think he was talking to you too. What are you doing down there? <laughs> no. And wh what are we doing down here? We have this <laughs> paradigm where we're focused on problems. You need a problem solver to solve a problem. And this is why I'm here to say that it's possible to create an economy where everyone belongs and how exciting that is for our future together. Thank you.